Hello everyone. We are continuing with the discussion of the characters of Canterbury Tales and we have reached the last group. The last group of our characters include the Reeve, Miller, Mansipal, Partner, the Summoner and Chaucer himself. Let us look at each of them in detail. First we have the Miller. The Miller was a chap of 16 stone. 16 stone here denotes his weight. A stone is supposed to be 14 pounds almost. So 16 stone should be more than 100 kilos. A great stout fellow, big and brown and born. So the miller is very stout. He is a man with a big huge physique. He did well out of them. For he could go and win the ram at any wrestling show. Now, now, Chaucer keeps telling us about the huge size or the huge strength Miller possesses. Now, the Miller can go to any wrestling show and win the Ram. Ram is like a prize given to the person who wins the wrestling match. And whenever the Miller goes for a wrestling match, wrestling show to fight, he surely wins the Ram. And he had bored, naughty and short shoulder that he would boast he could heave any door of hinge. Now he had such strong shoulders, such broad and strong shoulders that he can just break through any doors. Or he could even take a run and break it with his head. He doesn't even require his shoulders or the entire body. He only requires his head to break a door. That is what he boasts about. So just from these lines, we understand that the miller is a large man and he has immense physical strength. Chaucer continues to talk about his physical appearance in the following lines also. His beard, like any sow or fox, was red. So the miller had a red-coloured beard and broad as well as though it were a spade. So the beard was very broad, it was very wide, that it looked like a spade. And at its very tip, his nose displayed a rat on which there stood a tuft of hair, red as the bristles in an old sow's ear. And then Chaucer says, he gives a gross description about his physical appearance, that the miller had a hair-covered rat just on the tip of his nose. His nostrils were as black as they were wide. So he had deep nostrils, wide and black. And he had a sword and buckler at his side. He had the sword and a shield at the side of his body. And he had a mouth like a furnace door. Which means that he had a large wide mouth. Now having a large mouth could also indicate that he was a very loud man. He would never be quiet. He would always keep shouting and talking. So in the beginning of the description about the miller, we saw that he was a very strong man with a good physique. We did not have any negative impression about Miller till then. But slowly, his physical description starts to become gross. We get to see a grotesque figure physically. And then Chaucer calls him a wrangler and buffoon. A wrangler is a very loud and argumentative person. You would hate to make some reason with a person like that. They'll be always very loud and they stick to their point even if they are wrong. So a wrangler and a buffoon, he was also a fool according to Chaucer. He had a store of tavern stories. He had so many stories with him to say. But these stories were filthy in the main. These stories were not of such good topics. They were usually on immoral topics which show that he is very crude. He is not a very civilized person. He was a master hand at stealing grain. Now, a miller is a person who owns a mill, the place where he grinds all the grains into flour. Now, not only was he looking good, but he also was not a sincere person in his profession. He stole grains in his mill and he was a master at that. He felt it with his thumb and thus he knew its quality and took three times his due. So he used to take three times the amount that he is supposed to take from customers. He would just use his thumb to check the quality of the grain and then he would charge three times for the grains. 
and then chaucer uses this phrase a thump of gold in those days it was said that if a miller is honest he will have a thump made of gold now it is said so because an honest miller is very hard to find you will hardly find a miller who is very honest and you will hardly see a person with a golden thump so finding an honest miller is same as finding a person with a golden thump it's both very rare now here when chaucer says that this miller has a thump of gold it's not saying that the miller is honest we already know he is not is telling that the miller makes money he cheats people and makes money he is making gold out of his people his customers he wore a hood of blue and white coat he liked to play his bagpipes he has this musical instruments the bagpipes which are very loud and that was how he brought us out of town so here we are meeting a person who at first seemed very hero like someone who is very strong someone would uh, who would win any wrestling match that he will ever go to so he first seems like a hero to us and slowly we understand that he is a man who can easily be aggressive he is not able to control his temper so easily and he cannot interact with people politely also this character of the miller is reflected in the tale that he tells afterwards too he begins his tale when it is not his turn but then the host wouldn't say anything maybe because this man is very aggressive and he is also very strong and so the host might have thought that it would be better if they just let him say the tale and then move forward and it is only in the last second last line where we read that he liked to play his bagpipes it is only there that we see at least a humorous and a poetic soul to this character otherwise he is simply just equivalent to a beast but what is not worthy here is that people like the miller existed then and they do exist now so chaucer has a very realistic picture about the different people in the society people whom we mock we call them fools because their strength is only the best thing in them they do not have any wit and these are also the people whom we are afraid of and whom we listen to because of the same reason because they have immense strength now let's move on to the next character the mansiple the mansiple came from the inner temple now during chaucer's time there used to be four inns four institutions where law was taught so mansiple came from one of those inns of the court and it is the inner temple all caterers might follow his example in buying victuals so the duty of a mansiple is to bring supplies food and supplies to an institution here he is working in a court so he has to bring all the food and necessary supplies to the people the lawyers in the court so he was in charge of purchasing all these things now chaucer is telling that all the other caterers they are supposed to follow the example of this mansiple because he does it the best way he was never rash whether he bought on credit or paid cash he always bought the things very calmly whether he is paying the cash or buying it on credit and he used to watch the market most precisely for a person like him it is very important to know the market so whenever there is a good product that comes good quality thing that comes he will get it first he knows the market well he knows the prices well and he got in first and so he did quite nicely he did his work quite nicely he was in rush and he knew the market very well now is it a marvel of god's grace that an illiterate fellow can outpace the wisdom of a heap of learned men now here something seems fishy chaucer says that it's a wonder of god wonder of god's grace it's god's blessings that a man who is not educated like the mansiple a single man like him can outpace or outwit the wisdom of a group of learned men now lawyers are well learned 
Now these learned men, a group of learned men can all be outspaced by one man, one uneducated man. That is supposed to be a God's grace and there is some sarcasm in that line. His masters, he had more than 30 then. So he is working for more than 30 lawyers. All versed in the abstract legal knowledge. And all these masters who are well versed in the knowledge, legal knowledge, could have produced a dozen from their college fit to be stewards in land and rents and game to any peer in England you could name and show him how to live on what he had debt free. That is, these lawyers were good enough, educated enough to show the manciple how to live a life debt free, how to earn a living with the knowledge that they have. They were fit to be stewards. They could be made managers of estates by any nobleman. They were that good. Or be as frugal as he might desire and make them fit to help about the shire. Or they could even show the manciple on how to make a good move in a legal case, how to be cunning enough, how to win a case. That good were his masters. And yet, this manciple could wipe their eyes. This manciple could outdo them, could surpass them. That is, even though his masters were themselves very intelligent and cunning, they were good enough, they were intelligent enough to do cases well in the court. But the manciple was even more cunning than them that he could outdo all these learned men, this whole group of learned men. And again, there is some irony in that, that this common man is so clever that he can keep up with the wisdom of this group of learned men. Now, later on in Canterbury Tales, when we hear the Manciple's tale and the introduction to Manciple's tale, we understand that he is not actually a very good person. He is a person who deceives, he is very cunning, and he is also not a person whom you can categorize into the good group. Also, there is nothing about, no description about his physique here. And then we meet the Reeve. Now, Reeve is supposed to be the manager of an estate or uh, the manager of a land. He takes care of all the works in the land, from storing all the grains, uh, from collecting the taxes, paying the workers. He takes care of all the works in the land for the landlord. Now, this Reeve here was old, choleric and thin. So, he was an old man. He was very thin. He was very lean and he was choleric. Now, choleric here refers to the four humours again. Each humour is related to a body fluid. Here, the yellow bile is referred to. He is yellow tinged, which means that he has yellow bile excess in his body. And thus, he is a person who would get angry very easily. His beard is well trimmed. He has short hair, which kind of represents his occupation and class. And he has very thin legs, like sticks they were, and no calf was to be seen. His muscles were almost absent. He kept his bins and garners very trim. All his storehouses were well kept, that no auditor could gain a point on him. That is, nobody could find out any fault in what he does, in what the Reeve does. He seems to be good at what he does, right? Now again, Joseph says, he could judge by watching drought and rain the yield he might expect from seed and grain. Just by looking at the climate, the weather, he can judge what it is going to be like. How is the yield going to be like this time of the year? He was very good at that. His master's sheep, his animals and hens, pigs, horses, dairy, stores and cattle pens were wholly trusted to his government. So his master, the landlord, had given all the animals and all the birds, the poultry he had, all under his control. The reeve was in charge of taking care of all of this. He had been under contract to present the accounts right from his master's earliest years. So everything was given to him to take care and look after and he has to present all the accounts about how he has been looking after all this. So the accounts has to be presented to his master. So this was basically the job of the reeve. He was supposed to take care of the land. 
he knew exactly how to sow seeds how the harvest would be based on the weather and he knew to take care of all the animals so this is what he was supposed to do and this is what he did now chaucer says no one had ever caught him in arrears there were no unpaid debts he did not have any one to whom he has to pay any money there was no one who could claim that no bailiff sheriff or herdsman dared to kick he knew their dodges knew their every trick now here things have changed now even if he did something wrong and it has come to the notice of any of these people there wasn't any one who dared to show or tell that he has done this thing because he knew all of their tricks they were frightened of this reeve feared like the plague he was now plague refers to black death black death in those times in the 14th century it was an incurable disease it was killing all the people almost all the population of england so that was the depth of plague during those times now the reeve here he is feared like the plague by those beneath him by the people who worked the people who worked for him were frightened of him as if he is the plague he had a lovely dwelling on a heath he had a beautiful house shadowed in green by trees above the sward a better hand at bargaining than his lord he was good at making bargains and he was even better than his own master and thus he had grown rich and had a store of treasure well tucked away so he was even better than his master in many things that now he is rich and he has a big store of treasure could be grains which are all well hidden and he would only take it out to pleasure or please his lord with subtle loans of gifts or goods so he would only take once in a while he would just take out his wealth his grains to give as gift or to give as loans remember as loans to the landlord who has given him the land he is giving loans to his own landlord that's how rich he is and once in a while he would give his landlord gifts too so that he could earn his thanks and even coats and hoods when young when he was young he had learned a useful trade he had learned a craft that was carpentry and he was still a carpenter of first rate skill now there are two things here that chaucer mentions specifically which show us that the reeve was a wealthy person a luxuriously living person the first one is the stallion comb and the second one is the overcoat that he wore the stallion comb is one of the most best horses that you can find during those times the stallion comb he rode at a slow trot was drapel gray and bore the name of scott so the horse is gray in color it's a very fine horse and the name of the horse is scott he also had a luxurious blue overcoat and another thing we notice about his appearance is he had a rusty blade now usually if a person uses the blade the sword it has to be well kept and well maintained so the rusty blade might show that he is not a kind of a fighter he is not a person who would get into a fight with the blade and we also understand that he is coming from norfolk so the reeve that we met here seems to be a person who is able to do all his works well that none of his workers were able to lie or cheat in front of him but the reeve himself doesn't seem to be very sincere we understand that he is very rich and he takes out he has this big store of grains the treasure uh, out of which he takes out something only to give as loan or gift to his lord so uh, by what means he has gained all this treasure is a question his own workers fear him like the plague and the people who has something against to uh, against him to tell they also are frightened of him they also don't dare to do that so we do not know what he is behind the mask we do not know what he does but he doesn't seem to be that sincere and then we meet the summoner now summoner is a person who is hired by the church to find out what spiritual crimes are happening in the society 
so this person will be sent into the society by the church and he will find out if there is something wrong like an adultery or any crime that is against the church law and the punishment for these people whom the summoner finds out to have done something wrong these people would be excommunicated from the church they would be put out from the church now let's go through the lines there was a summoner with us at that inn that inn is at tabardin his face on fire like a cherubin now the face of the summoner looked as if it was on fire it was so red like a cherubin now cherubins are the small baby like angels with red cheeks now the summoner looked like cherubin not because he looked so baby like his face was very uh, sweet like a baby but his face was very red like a cherubin for he had carbuncles he had a lot of pimples all over his face that his face was very red his eyes were narrow and he had brows very bushy very hairy brows and he had a thin beard children were afraid when he appeared no quick silver lead ointment tata creams no brimstone no borax nothing seemed to take away those pimples from his face there was no cure for the pimples sitting on his cheeks and then chose a says that he loved to eat garlic onions and leeks all of these will leave a strong smell so he was not only having an appearance which is displeasing he also had a bad taste in food and on top of all this he drank strong red wine a lot he loved being intoxicated he was a summoner who loved being intoxicated and then he would shout and jabber as if crazy once he drinks then he starts becoming so crazy he shouts and he jabber he blabber whatever he has to say and then he starts speaking only in latin During those days Latin was supposed to be the language of the elite and the clergy so when he's talking in latin he might be showing that he is a learned man he is a man of high privilege and when he was drunk such tags as he was pat in he only had a few say two or three that he had marked up out of some degree no wonder for he heard them every day now as soon as he gets drunk he has some quotations in his head not too much just two or three what he has and he keeps telling this quotation out again and again these tags out and no wonder that he has learned this he might have heard this almost every day from some degree and then chosa mocks him again and chosa says it's easy to teach a j you might have heard of mocking j if you are a fan of hunger games the books or the series you might have heard about the bird mocking j which can easily imitate human voices so once something is repeated again and again the bird seems to catch it and it also starts to imitate and it also starts to repeat the thing just like a parrot but with more humanly voice so here chosa says you can teach the bird whatever you want but if you ask the bird deeper questions about what it is talking about the bird wouldn't be able to answer same way the summoner is also taught something he has learned some quotations from here and there some latin from there and some quotations from here he is all well done he looks very educated but if you ask him what this is what that is he has no idea so that is what chosa means when he says but had you tried to test his wits and grope for more you would have found nothing in the bag and then you would hear him say quistio quid juris which simply means what part of the law is this applicable on and then he moves on now chaucer sarcasm on the summoner doesn't end there chaucer says that he was a noble valet and a kind one now you could imagine what is going to come chaucer is not going to praise the summoner anyway here you would meet none better if you went to find one even if you go searching for a better summoner you won't find one why he would allow just for a quart of wine any good lad to keep a concubine so chaucer is telling see he's the best summoner you can get because if you just give him some wine he would allow any good young man to keep another woman and he had finches of his son to feather so chaucer is telling that the summoner himself had committed the sin of adultery 
and if he found some rascal with a maid he would instruct him not to be afraid even though the summoner's job is to find out these crimes and report it to the church and these people would be excommunicated from the church even though that was his job he tells the people who are committing these crimes such as adultery he would tell them don't be afraid if i report you to the church you would be under the archdeacon's curse but if you have something in your purse if you have money to give me if you can give me wine if you can give me something then you could be spared so don't be frightened don't be afraid in such a case of the archdeacon's curse unless the rascal's soul were in his purse in the following lines we understand that the summoner knows that he has immense power especially in these lines a curse should put a guilty man in dread and so on so he tells these people whom he find out who are doing uh, crimes against the church to these people he says see a curse from the archdeacon could be fatal you might be you might have consequences and you should be also beware of excommunication so it's not going to be very easy once you are cursed but don't worry if you have money in your purse then i can help you so he holds a lot of power over people and he knows that too and he uses it against them here maybe chaucer is not talking just about this summoner during those times this might have been the case generally too so anyway with his power he kept making money he got the wine he needed he had everything that he needed thus as he pleased the man could bring duress on any young fellow in a diocese he knew their secrets they did what he said once someone knows your inner deepest secrets they have total control over you he is a summoner and he knows their secrets and this gave him the power so they did whatever he said and chaucer winds up by saying that he always wore a garland on his head for some reason and according to me those flowers would be the only beautiful thing you would see on him even his appearance his character his behavior his ideas they were also wrong the flowers are the only thing on him that looks pleasing because in the case of the summoner it's not like he has an ugly exterior which is covering up his good personality it's both the same and it's equally bad we expect high standards from a person like him but his appearance and character doesn't match any of that and finally we have the last pilgrim that chaucer describes the partner the partner came along with the summoner he and a gentle partner he here is the summoner he and a gentle partner rode together a bird from charing cross of the same feather now just from this line we understand that the partner is no different from the summoner who used his powers to gain money just like the summoner the partner also used the powers he got from the church to make a gain now before moving on let's see who a partner is now the church has given special permission for some particular people called the pardoners who have the permission to sell written pardons for the sins of the people so if we have committed a sin and we are repenting that you can go to a pardoner during the 14th century you can go to a pardoner you can pay certain amount and in return you will get a written pardon in which there is the seal of the pope from rome so the person should make a donation and the donation should go to the church it won't go to the pardoner the donation is supposed to go to the church so the pardoner has gone to rome he has come back with pardons with the sign the seal of pope from rome he has just come back just back from visiting the court of rome and he is also loudly singing come hither love come home he is singing and the summoner who is with him he is also giving seconds to the song that the partner is singing and yes chaucer do mentions that their song is not that pleasing now chaucer uses all these given lines to describe the hair of the partner now the first line itself says this partner had hair as yellow as wax now normally the yellow hair is supposed to be a trait of a woman hair as yellow as wax hanging down smoothly the description when you go through it 
it's just like how a woman's hair is described in driblets fell his locks down to his shoulders thinly they fell like rats tail one by one his hair is described usually when we talk about a woman's hair the hair is beautified it's described in such lengthy descriptions the same way here partner's hair is also described and he wore no hood upon his head and the hood which he was supposed to wear was kept stored inside his wallet he was supposed to cover his hair his head with the hood that was how it was supposed to be during those times for a man of belonging to the clergy but just for fun he chose not to do that and from here itself we understand he is not a very serious religious person and the descriptions about him goes on he had bulging eyeballs like a hare he would sewed a holy relic on his cap now again chaucer describes his eyeballs and he compares it to that of a hare and not a rabbit again we have feminine traits coming in and on his lap he had a wallet and inside the wallet it was full of pardons brimful of pardons which he brought from rome all hot all fresh 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 pardons from rome which is which is all filled in his wallet now even without me telling you you might have understood the sarcastic tone here that he has bought all the pardons not for the good reasons now again you have lines here describing his physical appearance and his traits which uh, kind of makes us question his masculinity his sexuality like he had the same small voice of a goat and he had no beard his chin was very smooth and he was riding a mare and then chosa says you will never be able to find a partner with equal grace as him with this much grace this holiness like him because in his trunk in the trunk that he is carrying he had a lot of relics relics i told you it's a object that is related to a holy person we consider the object to be holy too because it was associated with the person who is holy but here again the hypocrisy of the pardoner is revealed he says he has many relics with him but we understand in the following lines that these things are not actually relics they are simply some false relics that he has collected on the way first he has a pillow case simply a pillow cover which he claims was a part of our lady's veil he says it's a part of virgin mary's veil it's only a pillow case but he claims it is this and then he had a part of the sail and he claims that this is part of the same sail which was on the boat when saint peter walked on water so this is also a relic and then he has a cross of metal set with stone also some animal bones pig bones and he would always carry these things with him he claims that these are relics and on the way if he finds some person some churchman some poor churchman he would claim that this is a relic and he would sell it to him and in one day he would make as much as money as this person makes in two or three months and he could just flatter and make stories so easily about these relics the false relics that he could make any priest or congregation monkeys he could just fool them very easily and these poor persons of the country side they do not know anything of this sort they do not know this level of corruption that they believe him but still joseph says in church he was a noble ecclesiast how well he read a lesson or told a story but best of all he sang an offertory now the pardoner is not allowed to preach or to give lessons to the people he only sells pardons which is given by the pope from rome but here he finds that he could make more silver make more money if he just goes out and preaches and gives a story so he reads a lesson tells a story and he sings for well he knew that when that song was sung he would have to preach and tune his honey tongue and then win silver from the crowd so he sang merrily and loudly 
Now Chaucer has put the partner at the end of the pilgrim's line. Now just like how Dante in his Inferno shows different rings in the Inferno where the outer ring consists of all the people who have committed the greatest sins. Here we have Chaucer showing that the partner is the most sinful among all the others. He is the most corrupt because he openly agrees about his hypocrisy. Even after being so corrupt, he is so proud of himself. He wears the relic on his hat, like a badge on his hat. With all this, he has become an object of ridicule for Chaucer and the other pilgrims and for even the readers, us. So the first person who might have to repent, who might have to get a pardon would be obviously him, the person who is selling the pardons himself. And with the partner, we have come to an end to the description of all the pilgrims. Now we have the concluding part of the general prologue remaining. We will discuss that later. Now we will wind up here. That's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching.